we have a lot of choices to make about our diet. Add to that doing the right thing when it comes to preventing or treating a chronic disease, fighting a virus, or losing weight, and suddenly our nutrition choices can seem almost overwhelming. Well, I'm here to help. Welcome to the Nutrition Facts Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Greger. I'm back on my treadmill today, ready to answer a multitude of your questions, including whether or not it's a good idea to get full-body MRI or CAT scans, and the benefits of protein restriction. Plus, I'll share with you a few dietary secrets. Okay, this is from Aiden. It says, what are your thoughts on full-body MRI scans to detect cancer at an early stage? Are the benefits outweigh the harms? And the answer is no, they would not. Now, you'd think it's really interesting. So this brings up the concept of overdiagnosis. You'd think, oh my God, that's exactly what we want, right? Because then you can get, you nip any budding tumors before um, they hurt you. The problem is most people have cancer, but most people die with their cancer rather than from their cancer. Um, and so if the cancer is not going to affect you in any way in your lifetime, you don't want to know about it because the then you just suffer, you have no benefits. I mean, the thing is, when you find it, you have no idea if it's going to hurt you or not. So, of course, you got to do something about it. And so whether it's you know surgery, chemo, radiation, whatever, you certainly have downsides from that. And if, in actuality, you would have never been affected by this tumor in the first place, so all risk, no benefit. Um, and so almost everyone dies with uh, thyroid cancers, um, like it's over 90% um, on autopsies. People have thyroid cancers, but 90% of people don't know they have thyroid cancer, so you don't want to know. Um, similarly, when you do, uh, you know, if you look at uh, car accident victims, women in their 30s, a significant percentage, I forget, I think it's about a quarter of women in their 30s have uh, breast cancers. Um, but many, the hope is that it'll grow so slowly that they never even know it by the time they die from something else. Um, and so because of overdiagnosis, you have to be very careful about cancer screening. And there are a few cancer screenings that are undeniably useful. You can actually have a randomized control trial showing you actually um, uh, affect all-cause mortality, actually save people's lives. And that's cervical cancer screening um, with pelvic exams and uh, colorectal cancer screening. Um, and there's a whole bunch of reasons to do that. And then there's certainly pros and cons of other screening methods, um, but not as um, uh, both much less certainty in terms of a benefit for all-cause mortality, and that includes PSA testing and mammograms and um, oral cancer screenings, etc. Anyway, um, great question and kind of counterintuitive answer, but in the end, we actually don't want to know in many cases and full body, and so it could start us down some therapeutic pathways that would actually do us more harm than good. Right, here we go. Next question. Uh, Donna, Dana says, uh, you said carrageenan extract isn't good, but is whole Irish or sea moss good as a source of iodine? Ah, okay. So um, um, Irish sea moss is where they get carrageenan from, packed with carrageenan. Um, and we know that at least the carrageenan used in the food industry um, may cause intestinal inflammation. Um, I was, I'm just um, starting now that the next book, How Not to Age, is done. And then just in fact checking and editing stages, I've started to script um, my next batch of videos for nutritionfacts.org. And I'm going to do an update on the carrageenan story. Um, uh, so we'll see where that leads us. But um, for that reason alone, I would assume that Irish sea moss, just because of the carrageenan content, if carrageenan isn't good for you, then Irish sea moss probably isn't good for you either. And I don't know what the iodine content is. Um, I would stick to um, ones that I do know, which is something like Dulce or Arme or Nori. Um, stay away from kelp because there's too much iodine and stay away from Hajiki because it has too much arsenic. Next up, Kirsten, are frozen greens like kale and spinach as nutritious and fresh? As fresh, in fact, sometimes can be more nutritious because they were actually frozen the day of picking um, as opposed to, you know, wilting for a week on the shelf and then in your crisper, uh, losing nutrition, being exposed to uh, uh, and uh, and losing nutrition every day. So frozen greens, pre-chopped, pre-washed, 
um, uh, you know, basically it lasts forever in the freezers. You don't have to keep going getting greens every day um, or Instacarting them. Uh, and so you look at my freezer, it's half frozen berries, half frozen greens. Um, and so I'm a huge fan and I say, go for it. Okay, next up, Phyllis says, how to reduce swelling in the legs after heart surgery. Um, and so, uh, as always, we need to treat the cause. It's basically three reasons that we have swelling or so-called edema in the legs. And that's problems with our kidneys, problems with the liver, and problems with our heart. Um, if it's a heart surgery issue, then perhaps we're talking about heart failure um, in that um, your heart just can't uh, effectively um, pump blood throughout your body. So it kind of pool and stagnate in the legs. Um, there are some things like compression stockings and elevation that can decrease the swelling, but really um, it's all about finding out the cause and treating the cause whenever possible. Okay. HG says, Oh, what am I eating today? Oh, my purple sweet potato easing smoothie is fantastic. That's very sweet. I wish I could have a Purple sweet potato. In fact, I just ordered a bunch yesterday um, and the store didn't have any. So I moved, um, many of you know, to rural Virginia recently. And there is a long list of things I can't find anymore that I did when I actually lived in civilization. I'm in a big city. Um, and so, for example, I can't get purple sweet potatoes. And I can't get lacinato kale, my favorite kind of kale. Um, this whole long list of stuff. I can't get my favorite uh, unsweetened soy milk. Ugh. Anyway, it's beautiful out here. And uh, there's lots of wildlife and trees. And there's certainly some perks. But I do miss my purple sweet potatoes. Anyway, what am I eating today? Um, this morning? Oh, this morning I had my cran. I forget what I call it. My palm cran chocolate bowl thing. I actually have a... It's one of the few things I have a cooking video about. Dr. Gregor in the kitchen. It's the last one I did. So if you just search for pomegranate on Nutrition Facts, it'll pop up. It's a great video. Um, and actually, it's because mostly the editing is just so good. So it really isn't me. It's just we got great editors. It's funny uh, and delicious. So, yeah, because it's pomegranate season. Don't miss out. I, there's only like two months where I can enjoy pomegranates and they're gone. Or at least certainly, I'm glad I can even find pomegranates around here. Oh, and then uh, lunch, I had some uh, leftover pasta, whole wheat pasta with tomato sauce made from, you know, no salt, stewed tomatoes, put in a blender, and uh, then tons of veggies and uh, yeah, kale and capers and, and, uh, and, and garlic and onions, obviously. What else did I put in it? Bell pepper, lots of spices. Uh, balsamic vinegar anyway delicious um oh so i made that like three days ago but uh had a little left over oh and then um uh, supper time uh probably after this i'll be able to eat for my next interview um and i got another leftovers which was um leftover chili actually with sweet potatoes kidney beans black beans more canned tomatoes um, lots of chili powder. Oh, and then on brol on the, my, you know, purple barley, lentil, oat groats, rye berry mixture, my prebiotic mix. Um, oh, and then with a whole bunch of kale, um, just regular curly kale. Cause I can't get the good stuff. Anyway, if anyone comes to visit, bring me some kale. All right. Next is from swag astronomer. Oh, other than Wakami, anything else for herpes? Great question. That's the only thing I've run across, although, no, yeah, I'm thinking of HPV for green tea. Yeah, I haven't run across anything else, um, uh, although I have not done a search. So um, I will do a search in my la in my uh, batch for my next videos and see if there's anything else about herpetic infections. Great question. Thank you. Lisa, Cal, can you, oh, the green, oh, the prebiotic mix. Okay, brol. Although, the now I've, I've added so many new stuff. It really doesn't spell burl anymore. But so the B stands for barley. Um, I get some wonderful purple barley. Um, R stands for rye. So you can get rye berries. O stands for oats. So you use oat groats, the whole oat groats. Um, and then L is for lentils. So I use this little beluga lentils. But also add sorghum now. Found a source of red sorghum. Amazing. Um, so it's like burls. And then I have millet. Um, what kind of millet? It's a really funky kind of millet. 
So millet, actually, as you know, isn't a real thing. There's no such thing as millet. Millet just means small grains. So there's like dozens of millets. What we think of as millet is just pearl millet, one of many millets. They're all different plants with different effects. Um, but this is finger, finger millet. So you finger millet and red sorghum. What else? There's something else I put in there. I think that's it. So it's like rolls them, rolls something. I need a better acronym. And so, yeah, you could swap out the um, rye and uh, barley if you wanted a gluten-free version. Okay. Jay says, when's the last time I was sick? Last month with COVID. It's been years since I've been sick. Um, and, I haven't, and I hadn't gotten COVID. And it's funny. I kept telling everyone. No problem avoiding COVID, you know, just avoid, you know, crowded indoor spaces um, for long periods of time. So I tell everyone that. And then what do I do? I go to a crowded indoor space for a long period of time, get COVID. Ironically, it was at a plant-based nutrition conference, the National Plant-Based Nutrition Conference. Uh, went there, got COVID. In fact, uh, this is sad. I actually canceled. I was going to switch to virtual. Um, I, I was originally going to be there in person. I was like, you know. I can just do it virtually. It's not as fun. I miss everybody. I want to see everyone. But, you know, it's not worth getting COVID over it. I hate being sick on the road. You know, switch to virtual. But then I'm like, oh, I want to see everybody. I've been stuck in my house for years. And so I was like, finally, okay. And so I was just so excited to tell the organizers, I'm coming. COVID be damned. Got COVID. Ah! Anyway. And actually suffered from uh, kind of this rare side effect, which continues to bug me. So anyway. I should take my own advice. Next up, Mike says, well, oh, would I, oh, would I recommend take vegans taking vitamin K2 supplement? I just did a webinar on that. Um, and the answer is no. Why? Um, because there's uh, no data suggesting vitamin K2 does anything that vitamin K1 doesn't do. Um, and vitamin K1, where is that found? It's found in dark green leafy vegetables. Um, and so there's purported benefits of K2 for the heart and the bones and um, heart bones. And what was the other thing? Heart bones are third. Anyway, it doesn't work for any of them. In fact, there was a big scandal of, of fraudulent data fabrication. Anyway, even if we did find out there were some unique benefits to vitamin K2, our body makes K2. Not only a microbiome from vitamin K1, but the cells in our body make K2 from K1, just like the animals that we eat. They're animals, we're animals, mammals do it, we're mammals. So we make K2 um, from the K1 that we eat, but of course we have to eat K1. How do we do that? Eat our greens. Um, Kira says, can diet, oh yeah, diet can cause pancreatitis. Um, uh, I have pancreatic insufficiency, but don't drink or smoke. So yeah, so alcohol. Um, alcohol binge can give you pancreatitis, um, but pancreatic insufficiency, uh, you know, there's two functions, main functions of the pancreas. There's the endocrine functions, which are like making insulin, and the exocrine functions actually spits out hormones through a duct into our digestive tract, um, helps with digestion, and that's what we typically think of with pancreatic insufficiency, though I, that's, I, don't, I don't think of that as being related necessarily to drinking or smoking. So ideally treat the cause. Um, and then there are some dietary tweaks. There's nothing you can do to kind of help with the symptoms of pancreatic insufficiency, but ideally find out what's causing in the first place, treat the cause and reverse the condition. That's always the, uh, the best way to go. Jonah says how to eat when you already had to mention how to pressure hospitals and care homes to give this food. Oh, good question. Well, you know, uh, Dr. Dean Ornish right now, after conquering killing number one heart disease, and uh, showing that for the first time in a randomized control trial, you can actually uh, uh, reverse the progression of cancer, in this case, early stage prostate cancer with a plant-based diet, says, all right, I'm just getting started. Let's see if we can reverse Alzheimer's disease with a whole food plant-based diet. Um, and it's currently running that trial now. Uh, we don't have the results back yet. It's not done, but I'm excited to report when it does. And if we do find out that indeed um, diets can help, then it's all about getting good food to our loved ones. In terms of individual foods, there's lots associated with prevention. I'm trying to think of any, um, but the only thing that comes to mind immediately in terms of slowing the progression um, would be uh, controlling cardiovascular risk factors. So controlling cholesterol, high blood pressure um, can actually slow the progression of Alzheimer's dementia, which certainly has to do with our food, 
Um, uh, there will be certainly a lot more. The biggest chapter is uh, the dementia chapter, preserving your mind in how not to age. Looking forward to that coming out. In fact, if I didn't have so many questions, I could look up that chapter right now and see if there's any particular um, foods that have been put to the test. Nothing jumps to mind. It's mostly in the prevention realm, um, unfortunately. Okay, please help, says Rose. Do I know of anything about Ehlers Danlos? Um, yes, that's like this hyperflexibility um, syndrome. Uh, just diagnosed uh, for a whole food plant based diet. Oh, stomach pain. I wonder if that's related. So you typically think of um, Erler Danlos uh, with like problems with one's heart, uh, problems with one's, uh, you can run into joint problems, there's skin changes. I don't think of, of uh, severe stomach pain. So I'm going to assume that that's uh, separate. Um, and so one shouldn't just kind of ignore it as like, oh, well, I got this syndrome. So that's why I got stomach pain. You really, your, doc, your physician really, your, or your healthcare professional really should look into why you have severe stomach pain. And it could be something serious and something easily fixable, um, uh, something like an ulcer or something. Um, and so you want to get that checked out. Uh, Zerius says, can uh, caffeine really affect anxiety? That's a good question. Um, let's uh, let's look really quick, shall we? Um, oh, I'm doing a whole series on anxiety. Oh, although I don't think I'm, I, I cover caffeine. Uh, so yeah, in, in, in scripting the, my next, you know, the USPSTF, the United States Preventive Services Task Force recently suggested uh, we should be screening kids for anxiety. Um, which seems like a huge gift to the pharmaceutical industry. This thing going to want to um, drug these kids, but and the question is: so what are the what are the lifestyle approaches to anxiety? Um, and so I'm going to do a whole series. Um, and so you know I'll include looking into something like caffeine. Let's look at uh, on anxiety for those with panic disorder. It turns out, um, dun dun dun, dun yeah. Um, so caffeine in doses roughly equivalent to five cups of coffee induces panic attacks in a large proportion of panic disorder patients. Also increases anxiety in panic disorder patients, as well as among healthy adults at these doses. So it sounds like if you have panic disorder, you should not be drinking five cups of coffee worth of caffeine. At least according to the latest systematic review on the subject published in 2022. Okay, Dr. Gregor, this is Galactus. Yeah, you don't seem to advocate for a mostly fruit diet. Why? Um, and so uh, the video uh, is one of my paleo diet videos, and it talks about how whether or not we're kind of like mostly frugivores, mostly folivores, I think, was the video. Um, whether mostly are we more like the, like the leaf-eating monkeys or the fruit-eating monkeys, and we are more towards the fruit-eating monkeys. But that's a different thing from saying we're frugivores. But, uh, yes, fruit may, it's an important part of our ancestral diet. And so why don't I recommend for a mostly fruit diet? Because there's an entire class of foods that are healthier than fruit, and they're called vegetables. What is a vegetable? Vegetables, any other type of part, part of the plant that's not the fruit. So there's root vegetables, stem vegetables like celery and rhubarb, leafy vegetables, flower vegetables like cauliflower. Um, and there's actually a higher nutrient density in those than in fruits. And so if you ate a lot of fruits, you wouldn't maybe not get enough vegetables in your diet. There's only so much stomach room, only so many calories you can eat in a day. And so I want people to get all these other wonderful parts of the plant into your daily diet. All right, Stephanie. Stephanie is confused because sometimes uh, I read you need B12 with methylcobalamin, sometimes with cyanocobalamin. Which one should I be taking? Cyanocobalamin. I already have videos saying why cyanocobalamin is better. I have another video coming out because people continue to get this message from people that are selling you methylcobalamin because it's more expensive. But uh, cyanocobalamin is more shelf stable. Um, and so more likely to actually contain B12. And since B12 is kind of important, um, you want to make sure that you actually get it. So that's why I recommend cyanocobalamin. Okay, Maxine said, is <laughs> what's the worst thing I ate recently? Well, in five days, it's my birthday. It's my 50th birthday in five days. And so we actually just went on a Nutrition Facts staff retreat. And they're so sweet. They made me a cake, which was actually a big black bean brownie. So that was super healthy. 
But to make the 50, they did little marshmallows. Yes, I ate some marshmallows. That's the worst thing I ate recently. Okay. Siba, can I explain why sugar is bad for our health? I'm an athlete, not worried about calories. So indeed, sugar uh, causes cavities, um, dental cavities. Um, if you say, well, I don't care about cavities. Okay. So it's empty calories. And you say, wait a second, I don't care about calories. Well, so you don't worry about getting excess calories, but you know, we only have a certain amount in the calorie bank every day. If you're an athlete, you have more than others. The concern is that you are, you know, if you eat hundred calories of sugar, for example, you are in effect, certainly over time, excluding hundred calories of something else you could be eating. Though, I mean, hundred calories of sugar gets you effectively zero nutrition. Whereas 100 calories of broccoli, 100 calories of strawberries, 100 calories of almost anything else, any other whole plant food, get you tons of nutrition. And you're just leaving that all on the table when you eat sugar. So, uh, yeah, those are some reasons why we shouldn't waste calories on sugar. STLD says, any recommended food or unrecommended food for type 1 diabetes? Uh, it would be the same recommendation for type 2 diabetics as type 1 diabetics. What we're trying to do is improve insulin sensitivity. So that's the responsiveness of our liver and muscles to insulin, whether created by our pancreas, if we have type 2 diabetes, or whether it's um, we inject it, which is type 1 diabetes and sometimes type 2 diabetes as well. Um, and so we want every unit of insulin to do as much good as possible. So we don't have to, so we inject less insulin, which is good in terms of cancer risk and other, and cost, God. So we are making our body as responsive as possible. And the way we do that is we decrease our saturated fat intake. I would also say trans fat, but there's not much trans fat in our food supply anymore. So decrease saturated fat intake that interferes with insulin signaling um, in our muscles and liver. And so it doesn't work as well. So you have to have more insulin um, either injected or pumped out from a pancreas, if you don't have type 1, to bring blood sugars down the same amount. Um, so improving insulin sensitivity is the way to go, and it's the same dietary changes centered predominantly around increasing fiber intake and whole intact plant foods and um, uh, decreasing saturated fat intake. Okay. Leon says, protein, protein, protein restriction over calorie restriction for human longevity. Ooh. Minimize BCAAs, branching amino acids. Can we be too low as to a detriment on whole food plant-based, say, protein um, below 10% of calories? Oh, my God, this is juicy. Um, and that's um, not just protein restriction in general, but, uh, you know, we're targeting the uh, sulfur-containing amino acids like methionine as well as the branching amino acids. Uh, but then you run into, um, well, what if protein gets too low? Do we worry about frailty? Do we worry about sarcopenia, the muscle loss with aging? And uh, so what should our target protein be? And um, what about all the metabolic benefits and the longevity benefits you see from protein restriction, but is it, how much is too much? And so basically the answer is um, we should shoot for 0.8 grams per healthy kilogram body weight from plant sources is kind of the, the bottom line. And that does the protein restriction for you in terms of BCAAs and methionine. Um, although... I think over age uh, 70, I was recommending uh, going up to uh, to one gram per health gram, gram by the way, don't, don't uh, quote me, but there is a bump later in age. I forget the, I forget the age cutoff, but you're totally right in thinking about this balancing act. And so, but under age 65, 0.8 grams per plant protein sources, and then we stick with plant protein sources, but we bump it up a little later in life. We would love it if you could share with us your stories about reinventing your health through evidence-based nutrition. Go to nutritionfacts.org slash testimonials. We may be able to share it on social media to help inspire others. To see any graphs, charts, graphics, images, or studies mentioned here, please go to the Nutrition Facts podcast landing page. There you'll find all the detailed information you need, plus links to all the sources we cite for each of these topics. For a vital, timely text on the pathogens that cause pandemics, you can order the ebook, audiobook, or the hard copy of my latest book, How to Survive a Pandemic, or go to your local public library for that matter. 
For recipes, check out my new How Not to Diet cookbook. It's beautifully designed with more than 100 recipes for delicious and nutritious meals. And of course, all the proceeds I receive from all the sales of my books go to charity. NutritionFacts.org is a nonprofit science-based public service where you can sign up for free daily updates on the latest in nutrition research via bite-sized videos and articles. Everything on the website is free. There are no ads, no corporate sponsorships, no kickbacks. It's strictly non-commercial, not selling anything. I just put it up as a public service, as a labor of love, as a tribute to my grandmother, whose own life was saved with evidence-based nutrition.